More swell is coming. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast, a week starting Sunday, February 27th. Storm surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. If you have any comments or questions, hit the comment section, write them down, we'll be happy to reply. And if you haven't subscribed, hit the Storm Surf logo down in the lower right hand corner and uh, you'll get automatic notifications when we post the video and uh, if not go to stormsurf.com and links to the video are posted at the top of every page on the site. All right let's get to work. Looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean we see the development of a new gale right here in the central Gulf of Alaska generating 20-foot seas aimed to the east and little bits of swell are likely expected for Hawaii and into the U.S. West Coast then potentially another gale developing off Japan right behind that. So the pattern, which is fairly active, continues. As usual, we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, but we don't see that. But we do have a consolidated flow. The jet pushing off of Japan with winds about 170 knots, pushing to the date line, weakening some, maybe dipping just a little bit right here. And that is effectively a trough. If it was deeper, it'd be a more obvious trough. But what that does is help create a counterclockwise flow aloft. It's like a river, and this is an eddy in the river. And that counterclockwise flow not only is up at the 30,000 foot level, but down at the ocean surface. And that, of course, generates winds. And winds, if they're strong enough, generate seas. And seas, as they radiate for the fat cherry, eventually turn into swell. And swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So it all starts with the trough in the jet stream. So we spend a lot of time looking for those. So the jet continues north of Hawaii and actually is the closest it's been the entire winter to the California coast, about eh, six, nine hundred miles, something like that off the coast. But then the jet splits with part of it going up into British Columbia or uh, let's say the Pacific Northwest, and the other half dipping south and then pushing into Baja. And typically in between a split jet stream flow, you get high pressure, which is exactly what we have. Beautiful sunny skies over California, light winds, pretty much exactly what you want, except if you're starved for water or snow, then that is exactly what you don't want. All right, but that's what we have, so we have to make the best of it. Uh, moving on into Monday, more of the same as forecast. The trough builds a little bit here in the Gulf of Alaska, helping uh, to support gale formation. Maybe a secondary trough developing here, approaching the northern Dateline region, and winds building some. Maybe that'll help develop another low-pressure system as this system continues into Tuesday off the Pacific uh, no West Coast. Then we get into Wednesday. The trough kind of fades out and falls, but notice the jet almost pushes into California. I mean, it's kind of trying to split, kind of not sure what it wants to do, but a little bit of energy, maybe pushing into California Wednesday night into Thursday. But then when we get into Thursday, you can see a big split starts developing just west of the dateline here. Wind's still pretty good, 180 knots pushing off Japan. But between that split flow, high pressure sets up. And when you have high pressure, at least in California, that means northwest winds. And that sort of smells like the start of spring. So we get into Friday, more of the same sort of thing happens. Saturday, yet more of the same. Notice this trough here, though, and a continued series of trough pushing over the north dateline region. As we even get into Sunday, yet more of the same. Now the split even moves further west to a point west of the dateline, while winds build to almost, let's see, can we get 190 knots? Nope. 180? Oh, there, 190 knots. Uh, Sunday night a week from now off of Japan, but with the split point being at the dateline or even west of the dateline, that limits the swell production area to just right here off the Kuril Islands. You can see this massive split here, high pressure indeed, strong in control, but let's do one thing. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah, probably right around in here. See the northern branch of the blit jet lifts north, and starts diving down the coast. And this is similar to that pattern we had in the Christmas time frame where you get these 
uh, backdoor fronts, they're called. The jet ridges up into Alaska and then brings cold air down south with it, and sometimes some moisture. Now, we don't expect anything like that's going to happen like what at Christmas, but maybe a little bit of a hint of some sort of precipitation into California. Not much, but maybe a drop or two. And as the jet splits and unravels further to the west, the high pressure system here will retrograde to the west. And that only increases the odds for this backdoor front pattern to set up. So fingers crossed, maybe there's hope for at least a couple of drops of rain into California. All right, let's go take a look down at the surface. What's going on? Surface level pressure, surface level winds. You can see right here, weak low pressure system trying to develop off Japan. Not even hardly a closed isobar low yet. 30, 35 knot winds. And then this other gale that we know is developing in the central Gulf of Alaska with 30 to 35 knot winds as well. So we get into Monday, the first trough or the first gale builds a little bit more, 30, there's probably some 40 knot winds buried under there in close proximity to California. A broader, stronger system with 45 knot winds starting to develop just west of the dateline, probably targeting Hawaii pretty well. So we get into Tuesday, the California or the Gulf uh, system starts fading, lifting off the northeast, but a broad fetch of 30, 40, 45 knot winds starts developing off the Krill Islands, targeting Hawaii pretty good, and the U.S. West Coast as well, continuing through Tuesday, and that fades out, but a secondary system starts building right behind that, right over the same area as we get into Wednesday, Wednesday evening, again with 40, 45 knot winds, so, oh, and there we go, a solid fetch of 45 knot winds Thursday morning, lifting north northeast again. And then yet another system right behind that as we get into Friday with 45 knot winds. And continuing 45, almost 50 knot winds Friday night, theoretically, yes, sure enough, and aimed well at Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast, but a long ways away from the U.S. West Coast. You can also see high pressure along the coast here. And then we get into Sunday, Still continuing north Dateline region with solid gale and yet more developing potentially off Japan. And we're, there we go, 180 hours out and pretty much a machine in the far west Pacific. That's great for Hawaii because these storms, relatively speaking, are close, though still a long ways away for Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast even longer away. If you were in California today, you saw there was waves. But you also know that there was insanely long waits between sets. That, because, that is because the distance from here over to here is like 3,500 nautical miles. Whereas from Hawaii to here, it's only 2,500 nautical miles. That's a lot of territory for a swell to get groomed and organized. But over 2,500 nautical miles, now it's almost starting to feel like a southern hemi swell where it's half hour waits between sets. And, you know, and when it comes, it's like, well, OK, I get what I can get. But it actually feels like the swell has lost a little energy in the transit there. And that was kind of the case today. Anyway, at least there is surf in the forecast. Let's go look at the effect of these winds on the ocean surface. All right. Now we're going back to Sunday a week ago. A gale developed off Japan. Again, this is 2,500 nautical miles to Hawaii, 3,500 nautical miles to the U.S. West Coast. Seas built 39 feet or so. The storm didn't even make it to the dateline. The dateline's right there, and it just petered out. This swell, of course, has it's still solid in Hawaii today, and a decent amount of energy pushed into California today. I mean, there were... I don't know, 10 to 12 foot waves and exposed breaks in Northern California. Why? Uh, we took a look and looked pretty solid there as well. And that's, and that's the two days of, uh, you know, two days away from California and it's still pumping. So pretty good swell production system indeed. And you can see the remnants of it pushed across into Friday and Saturday. And then here we are at Sunday today and you can see the swell front hitting the California coast and remnant energy still pushing into Hawaii. Looking forward, here's our gale in the Gulf of Alaska, 20 foot seas, forecast building to 28 feet. Yeah, probably over one tiny little area. This is the highest seas over this entire domain. These are the max winds and the coordinates for both of them. So 45 knot winds right there. So you can kind of look at this, get a quick eyeball what's going on. And Monday, 26 foot seas to continue. The new system starts building the West Pacific with 
26, maybe 28 foot seas, something like that. So we get into Tuesday, the Gulf system starts fading with 20 foot seas, but still 27 foot seas continuing over the date line, building to about 28 feet on Tuesday night. And then Wednesday, that system fades out, but we know there's another one right behind it. And there we go with uh, 29, it says 30 feet, but maybe on one pixel, but 29 feet. There we go. There's your 30 feet on uh, Thursday, midday. That one fades out. Another one right behind it, stronger expected. This is Friday night into Saturday with uh, 39 foot seas aimed off to the east and right almost on the date line. There we go. So a little bit closer to California. Um, and equidistant to Hawaii. So some swell potentially from that. And then we get into 180 hours out, and the next system starts building off Japan. So a pretty decent pattern is forecast here. Steady, long-distance swell for both the islands and California. Take what you can get, make the most of it, and hope that the springtime winds don't build in in earnest and just blow everything to, um, to pieces. And speaking of which, let's go take a look at winds. Right now, high pressure, you can see it right here, 1028 millibars, pushing into the northern California coast. Pretty light wind pattern today. Hawaii under light trades, not too bad. So we get into Monday, looks like much the same, but you see the gale here. You see sort of a prefrontal setup, high pressure, just trying to hold on over California. Light trades for Hawaii. Tuesday, still pretty much the same deal, which is good. The gale fades off, high pressure there, and a light pattern. Uh, it is, uh, we looked at the details, it's kind of hard to see here, but northeast winds, so it's more not pure trades for Hawaii at some point. Eventually, it's going to turn into that northeast, sort of setting up a, a north lump running down the north shore of Oahu, but not blowing too hard. As we get into Thursday, then high pressure builds in the wind machine starts for at least California north of Point Conception and maybe even more. A little cutoff low here. Uh, do, doing the same sort of northeast trade thing for Hawaii and probably building more as that low comes closer to the Hawaiian Islands. Almost north winds possible. Strong north winds Friday into California. Saturday, a mess. The cutoff low. Sure, that'll generate swell and exposed breaks in Hawaiian Islands, um, but you also notice the northeast trades. And Sunday, same sort of deal. If anything, the winds are pure north, and then we got even stronger north winds for California at 30, 25 to 30 knots, and probably even pushing into inside the Channel Islands for Southern California. So sort of a, and just like 1038 millibar high, just filling the Gulf of Alaska. We know there's a split jet stream pattern here. It just smells of spring, and given that it'll be first week in March, probably not too far off track. Precipitation for California. Here we go. There's the northern border right there. We know there's something going to happen, but as we get into Monday, Tuesday, nothing. Wednesday, try. You see a front here pushing into Cape Mendocino down to just barely, let's say, the Golden Gate. So maybe San Francisco will see a couple drops. A little bit of precip maybe into Tahoe. There you go right there. And down to the Central Sierra, but just just a smidgen, nothing more than that. We're into Thursday and Friday, maybe uh, Friday night, a dusting of snow again, and then high pressure takes over. A little bit, you see that little backdoor slider right there, right here. And we know the jet's going to be falling down the coast on Sunday. You see just a dusting of snow down the Sierra on Sunday. And then that fades out and where we are, we're 180 hours out, high pressure in control. So a little bit of snow, but not much and even less rain. Snow forecast dashboard for Squaw Valley, Olympic Valley, a couple of inches and pretty much the same. We'll go look at Mammoth real quick and even less, maybe half of an inch. Snow levels, uh, well, we can see our freezing level. About 8,000 feet today, working its way up to 10,000 feet as we get into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then falling again as the back door, that back door jet stream starts pushing down the California coast. Temperatures will drop into the about the 3,500, 4,000 foot level in the evenings, a little bit higher, maybe uh, 6,400 feet during the day. And then as we get to the March 7th or so, then the uh, freezing level starts working its way up consistently at 7,000 feet, pushing to 8,000 feet. So 
Not a great setup for snow, but take what you can get, I guess. <laughs> Moving on, let's take a look long term. The long term outlook. What's going on with the Madden Julian Oscillation and, of course, the El Nino Southern Oscillation? El Nino or La Nina? Well, I think we know, but we'll see. As usual, we start by looking at winds on the equator across the equatorial Pacific. Um, this is data from the TAO buoy uh, ray, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. But they have wind sensors on them. We get five-day average winds, not real-time hourly. But it's enough to help us look for the active phase of the MJO. The Madden-Julian oscillation is this periodic weather oscillation. On one side of the planet is the active phase. On the other side, the inactive phase. They rotate around the planet on the equator from west to east. So the active phase is a low pressure system, a broad, slow moving a uh, bias in the atmosphere towards low pressure. It creates clouds. It uh, enhances precipitation. And if it's strong enough, when over the West Pacific, can, it can actually suppress trade winds. And that's what we want to see. Because when trade winds are suppressed in the West Pacific, that can actually help take warm water that's in the West Pacific, push it to the east. If the winds are strong enough or actually reverse and turn westerly rather than easterly, that can create what's known as a Kelvin wave, a ball of warm water that travels under the equator across the Pacific, erupts off of the Galapagos and Ecuador, and, and creates a warm pool there. When you have successive active phases of the MJO that create successive Kelvin waves, that can help usher in El Nino. And everyone knows that El Nino, of course, feeds energy into the jet stream over the Pacific, really enhances the storm track, and increases uh, precipitation amounts into California, and makes giant surf if it's strong enough. Conversely, the inactive phase of the MJO is effectively a high pressure system, a bias towards high pressure that enhances trade winds, it suppresses storm production, it does not help create Kelvin waves, it creates, if anything, cold water Kelvin waves, the opposite of a warm water Kelvin wave, and that supports high pressure. And this is where we've been for the past two years, just nothing good in terms of storm production or precipitation production. So it's no wonder that we've been in a drought for a couple of years because we've been in La Nina, and the inactive phase of the MJO dominates during La Nina events, the active phase dominates during El Nino events. All right, so we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. So here's the East Pacific, here's the West Pacific, here's the equator. The arrows are what we're looking at. The longer the arrow, the stronger the winds. So pretty strong east winds over the East Pacific. Same thing over the Central Pacific. And in the West Pacific, we call it the Kelvin Wave Generation Area because when the active phase is over here, it can reverse the trade winds here, and that can do all the things we talked about in terms of Kelvin waves and ushering in El Nino. But we don't see any signs of that. But it's not the actual wind speeds. It's the anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. Yeah, these winds are strong out of the east, but for this time of year, are they stronger than normal? Well, we look at the little arrows here and go, Yep, it kind of looks like it. Lightly stronger than, than normal. Same thing over the Central Pacific. Same thing over the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. So, looks like the inactive phase of the MJO is in control based on this data. Let's dig a little deeper. Here's 850 millibar vector wind anomalies for the past five days. Same sort of deal. We're just looking at the arrows and, oh, let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Chile, Peru, Central America, Hawaii right there, uh, New Guinea right there. Zero is the equator, the date line right there. Kelvin wave generation area, the West Pacific right here. You can see the blues, those are easterly anomalies. That's synonymous with the inactive phase of the MJO. And, and the arrows actually point out of the east. Same thing on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th. So it looks like the inactive phase of the MJO has been in control for a few days now. The one week forecast, all right, this is again 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies, but it's over the entire planet. There's no arrows, but let's get ourselves oriented. 180 west, that's the date line right there. Far west Pacific's at 135 east. I just know that by, by looking at maps, so take our word for it. Um, Kelvin wave generation area starts in the far west Pacific from 135 east to about 170 west, so draw a box like right in there. Oh, and this is past performance here. This is the forecast here. You can see blues, oh, blues are easterly anomalies, yellows and reds are westerly anomalies. Well, since January 28th, 
All we're seeing is blues, easterly anomalies, synonymous with the inactive phase of the MJO. The forecast for the next week, if anything, the inactive phase builds even more till it gets till about the 4th of March. And then it looks like it might start breaking up some, we hope. Let's go look at a forecast. So this is outgoing. Uh, it's a forecast for what they call outgoing long wave radiation. Cloud cover is all. Again, we said the active phase of the MJO, that's the one we're interested in, is like a low pressure system. Low pressure systems typically are rising air that uh, uh, enhances evaporation and pushes warm, wet air higher in the atmosphere hit where it hits cold air and then turns into precipitation. Um, so this chart shows you potential for precipitation. The blues are favorable for precipitation. Negative anomalies here, that means less sunlight reflecting off the ocean's surface. And why would that be? Because you have clouds. So one could say, well, here's the active phase of the MJO, and this is the opposite. More sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface, high pressure, the inactive phase of the MJO. Let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, EQ, the equator, dateline roughly right there. Kelvin wave generation area right here with the inactive phase of the MJO in control. This is per the statistic model. Five days from now, same deal. Ten days from now, so about a week and a half, no MJO activity. And then two weeks from now, well, at least the inactive phase of the MJO is gone with maybe just a very weak active phase over the West Pacific. We want to see this, but times about 10. Now this is the statistic model. The dynamic model, a little bit more favorable. In fact, you can just we'll cheat here. There's the last frame of the statistic model. There's the last frame of the dynamic model. So inactive phase, inactive phase, maybe holding on for 10 days. And then the active phase moving into the West Pacific Kelvin wave generation area and a little bit stronger than what the statistic model projected. Let's dig deeper. Phase diagrams. A Another version of the two models we looked at before, the statistic model there, dynamic model there. The MJO, active or inactive phase, moves from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continents like Bali to the West Pacific to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Round and round she goes. This chart only depicts the active phase of the MJO. Here's where it is, where the heavy dot is today. This squiggly line here is where it's been the past month or so okay the further the dot is away from the circle the stronger it is so a very weak active phase of the mjo in the we'll say the east indian ocean the west maritime continent the forecast has it moving to towards the west pacific but exceedingly weak two weeks from now the dynamic model pretty much saying the same thing with the active phase just collapsing to nothing. Now, last week, if you remember, the active phase was supposed to be out here and pretty strong. So these two models now are in sync and not really giving us any real hope. The one month CFS model, all right, same deal, whole planet on one chart, dateline runs right up the middle, far west Pacific, 135 east, so right about there. This is all past performance. This is the forecast down here, Kelvin wave generation area in this box here. You can see the blues are our easterly anomalies right there, the dotted contour. That's the inactive phase of the MJO. Again, so today, well, this was as of the 26th. So we're about in the depths of the inactive phase of the MJO right now. Strong easterly anomalies forecast into about, about a week from now. That tick marks a week. And then here comes the solid contours, the active phase of the MJO. And about a week from now, it pushes into the West Pacific but doesn't make it very far. It makes it to the dateline and then fades. It brings some westerly, the, the reds here, westerly anomalies with it, but then these easterly anomalies rebuild. So not a very productive active phase of the MJO per this model. Let's go look at one more. This is the three month CFS model. Again, whole plan on one chart, dateline right up the middle, uh, far west Pacific right there. There you go. And uh, the Kelvin wave generation area ends right around in there. And what you see is, well, just eyeballing this. Oh, and this is past performance here. This is the forecast here. And just eyeballing this, you see very strong easterly anomalies for the next week or two. Something like that. Oh, these are in one, about a week, week and a half. But then you see the yellows, westerly anomalies building, making it almost, well, California is at 120, 
almost to California as we get into late April and May, and filling the Pacific. So that clearly to me is a sign that La Nina is losing its grip, at least according to this version of this model. In fact, let's overlay the MJO. Here we go. All right, so dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO. You can see it was, you know, pushing across the maritime continent into the Pacific and moving out of the, the entirety of the Pacific by March 15th, two weeks from now, but out of the Kelvin Wave Generation area about a week from now, a little bit of lingering easterly anomalies. Then here is the active phase of the MJO, pushing its way across the whole way into California as we get into late April with westerly anomalies taking over now here's the end then you go beyond that even though there's there's an inactive phase of the mjo forecast in the early may time frame westerly anomalies persist so we've been watching this model yesterday or the day before it had the easterly anomalies building like rebuilding and pretty strong but now today's model is back to a what we've been sort of looking at for the past you know a couple of weeks at least if a month with this, the fading of La Nina. In fact, let's overlay the low pass filter here. So this is really what matters. So this is the dotted contour, high pressure bias. And that doesn't mean pure high pressure, but the tendency, and this is an area favorable for high pressure development. And you can see two contours and the, lead, the, the trailing edge here, well, 180 is right there, the date line, almost out of the west pacific where it's been filling the entire you know kelvin wave generation area back in november and december slowly easing off to the east with the low pressure bias a solid contour this would be the el nino don't really want to say it because this doesn't really mean el nino it just means uh, more of a neutral to el nino-ish flavor bias moving in and almost reaching the date line as we get into the early part of may with a second contour developing to me this indicates the death of la nina and at least a return to a normal pattern as we get into may that said the jet stream's all biased and there's a lot of momentum in the atmosphere and just this happening isn't going to like instantly turn us into a a normal neutral pattern but maybe three to four months after that, as we get into next fall, then we'd be predisposed to a more normal pattern uh, at that point in time, theoretically, if all the stars align. All right, so let's go take a look down in the ocean. We're done with the MJO discussion, and what's that going? Now we're moving into the El Nino-La Nina discussion. First place, and of course El Nino, La Nina, they affect not only down in the ocean, they affect the ocean surface, and they affect the atmosphere above the ocean. So we're looking for signs of some movement towards, or at least away from La Nina. Data from the TAO buoy array. Again, that series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. These little X's, these are the anchor lines on the individual buoys. The X's themselves are sensors on those anchor lines. You can see there's, you can't see it, but there's actually one there, 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 about every 15 degrees, this whole array here is down. There, 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 you get the picture, right? Take the data from the sensors, they uh, beam it up to a satellite, send it to a central processing facility, use a model to fill in the gaps, because there's not a whole lot of data here, and this is over, you know, thousand, was it probably 4,500 4, or 5,000 nautical miles on the equator uh, in the Pacific Ocean, but anyway, you can see the 29 degrees centigrade, centigrade isotherm here at about 165. I think it was at 168 last week. The, uh, the 28 degree isotherm was at 78 or 79. It's backtracking a little bit. The 24 degree isotherm, though, pushing the whole way across the Pacific, suggesting that we're, we're in a better place than we were because this whole winter, this 24 degree isotherm never made it past 140. Cold water all here. But now this suggests that there's some semblance of normal warm surface water trying to work its way into the East Pacific, probably driven by slacking of trades and maybe Kelvin waves. In fact, anomalies. The, again, differences from normal for this time of year. This is the temperature pattern, but how different it is, is it compared to the past 30 years? What you see is there's a ball of warm water here in the West Pacific, two degrees centigrade above normal, another ball at two degrees here, 
approaching Ecuador. Remember we talked about Kelvin waves. They push across the Pacific, not on the ocean surface, but under the ocean, driven by trade winds in the far west Pacific. We call it the Kelvin wave generation area, driven by the active phase of the MJO. And then this Kelvin wave, this is the leading edge of a Kelvin wave, pushing into Ecuador as we speak, or right on the verge of it. Now, this little pool of cold water has just developed. All this was connected a week ago. There's a little gap. We're wondering if this is almost a new Kelvin wave here, or is it just a broken part of the old one? We have another model here. Here we go. This tells pretty much the same picture, West Pacific, East Pacific. Um, the last cool water from La Nina here, gurgling to the surface, being pushed by the leading edge of the Kelvin wave. But there's a break here. And with strong easterly anomalies forecast for the next week and that have been in play and um we think that perhaps that's really having a negative impact on this kelvin wave and preventing it from making it the whole way but it's a little bit early to know exactly what's going on we're not too worried at the moment but it's something to keep note of Sea level anomalies here. Let's get ourselves organized. South America, that's Chile, Peru, Central America, Mexico, Baja, Hawaii right there, Equator right there, Dateline right there, New Guinea right there. This is not temperatures. This is the height of the ocean. Strip away uh, wind waves, swell waves, storm generated waves, even tides. And is the surface of the ocean higher or lower than normal? And why would that be? Well, if you have cold water at depth, cold water contracts, it'll make a divot on the ocean surface. Uh, likewise, warm water at depth will expand, create a bump on the ocean surface. If you have warm water moving from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, you'll see positive anomalies. So we see positive anomalies here, the reds and yellows. And we see, we don't see negative anomalies, but we see kind of neutral anomalies on, and it's just on the equator. That's where Kelvin waves are, under the ocean surface. And you can see right here, well, there are some positive anomalies. It's only 5 degrees north and south of the equator. So signs of this Kelvin wave making it, well, there's the Galapagos to almost the Galapagos. little finger pushing there. And we see cold water going that way and that way, sort of like the warm water is like a bulldozer pushing this way, pushing cold water out in front of it, pushing it up to the surface. And as it streams out, it streams out around the edges of the approaching bulldozer. Sort of like when we were in the depths of La Nina, trades were nuking, cold water was pushing this way, taking the warm water and creating a horseshoe pattern there. Now we have a cold water horseshoe pattern here, suggestive that the Kelvin wave is doing something. How far and how strong it is, hard to tell. Upper ocean heat anomalies. All right, this is the temperature thing over time. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. And this is subsurface water we're talking about, not the surface. So we go back to March of last year. Kelvin wave, warm water pushing across the Pacific. April, another one. June, another one. And then it all just died. Trade started nuking. We had one, two, three cold water Kelvin waves, and that just set us up for La Nina again. This is wave two of La Nina. But then here in December, we had the active phase of the MJO, and that created the Kelvin wave that right now is pushing across the Pacific to about 95 west. You see a little bit of a break there. And it's really unknown whether we're going to get another Kelvin wave from the next uh, active phase of the MJO. It's not forecast to be that strong, but I, with the general westerly wind anomaly pattern that's going to set up from at least the date line, if not a little bit more east, I would think that it's going to be pretty hard to get as much cold water as what we've had in the past. That said, we have one strong active or inactive phase of the MJO happening right now. We got one week of it left, and will it do damage? Unknown, hard to tell. All right, so let's go take a look at the ocean surface now. All right, uh, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, California up there, Hawaii there, equator right here. Yes, clearly this is a sea surface temperature anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. Broad area of cooler than normal water. The blues are cooler than normal. But the really good news is this area here, 
was very dark blue for months and weeks. This is the mildest it's been in two years, really, and suggestive that La Nina is losing its grip, that there isn't really any more cold water at depth unless something happens in the next week or two, and the active phase of the MJO is setting up. So it seems pretty hard to believe that we're somehow going to just like drop into La Nina just looking at this data, though there is a pretty good outflow here along Peru, colder water, but that's that's not atypical, especially for this time of year. Next up, sea surface temperature trend. Good news here. The yellows and oranges, warmer than normal. And it's really Peru, Ecuador, this area, and it's really five degrees north and south of the equator that really matters right here. And that's all warmer than normal, other than a little tiny pocket right there at the Galapagos. And temperatures continue to warm off of Peru and Chile, too. That is good news, because if you saw here, this big pool of cool water is off. Well, there's Peru, there's Chile, and out pretty far, well, there's south of Hawaii. So let's reorient south of Hawaii there. You see a general warming trend over all this area that has been cool. So this data pretty much supports, and this has been the trend for a couple of weeks now, is that this cool pool is steadily warming and losing its grip. In fact, here's the backed off view. Same sort of thing. Yes, it's cooler than normal out here, but you see bits of warming starting to build in, and the depth of the cooling, not nearly as cool as it was. Yeah, it's pretty still a broad expanse of coolish waters that supports high pressure that uh, definitely stomps on evaporation and that you know when we said La Nina is dying it's going to take a while to get to a normal pattern what we really talk about is the dissipation of this cool pool and getting back to at least normal you see everywhere else on the planet the entire Atlantic warmer than normal the entire Indian Ocean <laughs> warmer than normal all the coolings right there uh, we think that's going to change though the Nino 1.2 sea surface temperature index, just a running day by day. What's the temperature? Today, we're up to, it's only one degree below normal, 1.043 thousandths of a degree below normal. We've been down in about the one to one and a half degree range or deeper for months now, typical of La Nina. This is not the official El Nino monitoring region. This is just right that area right there along Peru. Really, it's more like Ecuador and the Galapagos, that area. This is the official area, the Nino 3.4 region, from a point south of California and the equator out to about the dateline. Temperatures today, about three quarters of a degree below normal, 814 thousandths of a degree right there. You have to be half a degree below normal for five consecutive three-month periods. We haven't been above half a degree, but for maybe each one of these dots is a day. Two days since December and a lot before that. So still clearly in La Nina territory, we want to get this curve bending upwards. So what does the atmosphere think is going on? Clearly we have a lot of cool water over the central Pacific on the equator. We said that probably supports no evaporation sports high pressure all right is there a way to historically sort of get a sense of where we're at well yeah we can there's a long running uh, um pressure uh reading over front at tahiti and darwin australia when pressure is lower in tahiti you can integrate these numbers and get an index value when the you integrate them and the index is negative that suggests lower pressure over tahiti which is basically in the central pacific when pressure is higher in Tahiti relative to Darwin, the index goes positive, suggestive of at least the inactive phase of the MJO, if not La Nina. Today's value, plus 19.55. And just sort of scanning down through here, yeah, we've had a couple of negative readings, but by and large, all the readings have been positive. The 30-day average takes the noise out of this. Today's value, 9.07. Where have we been? Well, we were down at 1.57 in January. That was probably during the active phase of the MJO. We moved into the inactive phase. We're still there, there. but still 9.07. The high point in last year's La Nina was 19, so 10, 10, uh, 10 increments higher. The 90-day average, our El Nino La Nina indicator, today it's 7.68. Where has it been the past month? And eh, was it 9? We're down to 7.5, something like that. Um, 
Last year, this was up to 15, something like that in the January time frame. So we're still in La Nina, not anywhere as strong as we were last year, but still La Nina nonetheless. We want to get out of La Nina. Here's the index graphed out. This is a 30-day moving SOI. Back in 2020, early 2020, we were borderline just minimal El Nino. And then in 2020 in the fall, clearly you can see so these downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO, the upward spikes, the inactive phase of the MJO. A preponderance of inactive phase of the MJO set us into clear La Nina, January 2021. We got a little bit of a break last summer. We're doing the same thing, but you see we're nowhere near as high as we were last winter. Still La Nina, though. This winter is effectively over. It seems like we're moving into spring. But, and spring typically is dominated by high pressure and the inactive phase of the MJO, supposedly. But we looked at the charts and said, well, that's not really the case. It looks like the, a weak active phase of the MJO. So maybe we're seeing some softness in La Nina and we're not going to continue in this pattern. Hard to say. Now here comes the dilemma. And this is the same thing we talked about last week, but it's even gotten worse. This is the CFS version 2 model. We consider a pretty good model. This is forecast temperatures for the Nino 3.4 region. Again, La El Nino is a half a degree or higher for a bunch of months in a row. El Nino is half a degree or lower. Here's where we are today at about 0.75 degrees below normal. This model suggests that some massive inactive phase of the MJO, easterly anomaly event, something is going to occur that's going to push temperatures instead of warming down to one and a half degrees below normal as we get into May. And then even at the whole way through summer, we sit there. And even as we get into the fall, we're still 1.05 degrees below normal. Now, this is raw data, and no one knows this that this is problematic, so they have a corrected version here. But even the corrected version is saying temperatures hanging at one degree below normal as we get into the fall. We looked at a whole bunch of other models, was it last week or the week before? And they all said, none of this is true. We're going to uh, end so neutral. Um, so, the debate is, is this model completely out to lunch and not know what's going on, though we consider it pretty much a gold standard model? Or do all the other models, like there's 30 of them from different countries, they all know something that this model doesn't? We're going to have to see. This seems like an outlier, but I would say in the next March time frame, if temperatures continue to fall and track to what this model says, and I'd say maybe this model knows something we don't know. And then the next question is, and someone actually asked the question, uh, was it last week's or this week's uh, comments? Well, have we ever had three years of La Nina? I went back and looked a back a lot of years, and the answer is no. We've had a five-year La Nina, but there was an El Nino in the middle of it. It wasn't a continuous five years, and I think we got maybe two and a half years out of it. But... According to this, I mean, it looks like we're going to, if this is right, we're, we're into a full-blown three-year La Nina. Now, again, I don't believe it. I don't think it's real, but I'm not going to completely write it off because I kind of believe this model a little bit. All that said, the good news is it's almost March. Effectively, it is March. We have a series of, like, almost a wave machine set up here. The jet stream splitting in the east, but gale after gale after gale forecast for the West Pacific, Pacific generating surf, targeting Hawaii, the U.S. West Coast. So there's swell coming. Great. And the high pressure in the split jet stream is supposed to retrograde, so it opens up the possibility for weak backdoor fronts pushing into California. So maybe a little bit of snow. I mean, it would be cold snow. It would be light snow. That's okay. Maybe not feet of snow, but at least a dusting, anything, and maybe a couple of drops out of the sky, we'll take it. Um, longer term, though, there is this just un 
knowable debate between the models of are we going to continue in La Nina or are we going to go to normal? Even the very model that says we're going to continue in La Nina, you look at other parts of it, it says, no, the low pressure bias is supposed to move to the date line and things sort of returning to normal with westerly anomalies over a good portion of the Pacific a month from now. So something is a little hokey with the CFS model. We'll have to wait and see. Spring unpredictability barrier in the model. That is starts in, I think it's the April time frame and goes to the end of May, something like that. So the models have a hard time there anyway. They don't know what's going on. So there's a lot of ambiguity. We think we're probably going into ENSO neutral long term, but we'll just have to wait and see. Then somebody asked a question, well, what about the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation? Are we in the warm phase or still in the cool phase? I think that's up for debate, but given the depth and the persistence of this La Nina, I'd say we were, were thinking we were out of the cool phase of the PDO. We've been in it since 98, after the big El Nino of 97-98, and the bias has been towards cooler ocean temperatures. I think we're still there. I don't think we're out of it. And when are we going to get out? We don't know, but for right now, I think we're still in the cool phase of the PDO based on what's going on with this La Nina. All right, so that's it for this week. Again, if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. Comments, questions, always welcome. Subscribe, hit the storm surf icon in the lower right-hand corner. You get automatic notifications. And other than that, go get some surf. There are going to be waves. Make the most of it. Hopefully the wind won't be too much of a problem in California, but it smells like spring. So make the most of what you can get. All right, see you next week. Thanks for watching.